welcome everyone to this, uh, um, the first Iconics webinar after the summer break. Uh, we're picking up uh, the series um, and uh, we will focus today on uh, yet another recommendation from the uh, O'Neill et al. paper that was published about a year ago. Um, there was a long list of recommendations of how to go about improving the um, the, the scenarios framework and, um, and, and one of those uh, was around thinking more fundamentally about uh, baseline scenarios that include policies and that include the impacts of climate change and how to bring those into the framework and, um, and have those combined uh, baselines. And so we had a very brief discussion on that in the spring version of the, of the webinar when we went through all of the recommendations, but today we go in depth um, into this topic. Um, a few housekeeping uh, rules. We have set the settings uh, now a little bit restricted actually, so that you cannot uh, unmute yourself or, <laughs> uh, or, or share on camera. We will, once we get to the Q&A, uh, you'll uh, have to, if you raise your hand, uh, we can uh, ask you to unmute and to make yourself known. Um, with that uh, said, we also uh, are recording the, pre uh, the, the webinar and we'll uh, put it on, on YouTube. So if you want to remain uh, anonymous, then don't, uh, then let us know. Well, if you're asking a question and, um, uh, and, and don't open your, your video in that case uh, while asking your question. Um, so today's uh, webinar will be uh, such that we will first have Tim Carter uh, from uh, the Finnish Environmental Research Institute uh, introduce the topic. Then we have uh, Elmar uh, Kriegler talk about for 10 minutes or so about uh, mitigation scenarios and mitigation policies uh, that can be combined with baseline scenarios. And then uh, we'll move on to uh, Francesca Piontek. Uh, also from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research to think about impact baselines, baseline scenarios that actually include climate impacts and how, to, how those can fit. And then we'll open for uh, a panel with uh, Q&A. Oh, yeah. So let's uh, move into the first presentation uh, from Tim on... Uh, setting the scene, the topic of integrated policy impact scenarios. The fourth recommendation in the O'Neill et al. 2020 Scenarios Framework paper is to produce a broader range of reference scenarios that may include impacts and or policy. This section of the paper was drafted by myself, Tim Carter from the Finnish Environment Institute, Suke, in Finland, Elmar Kriegler from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, PIC, in Germany, and Brian O'Neill from the Joint Global Change Research Institute in the US. We've already heard that SSPs are reference pathways describing societal trends that make it easier or harder to mitigate or adapt to climate change. This is shown as challenges to mitigation and to adaptation on the axes of the graph on the right hand side of the screen. SSPs are designed to represent uncertainties in socioeconomic factors that affect on the one hand greenhouse gas concentrations that are responsible for the anthropogenic forcing of the climate system and on the other hand exposure and vulnerability of societies to impacts of those climate changes. However, it's important to remember that these SSPs assume no climate policy and no impacts of climate change. They are in a sense counterfactuals or baseline scenarios against which we can compare the effectiveness of policies of mitigation and adaptation. However, this is only one possible way of constructing a counterfactual and alternative reference scenarios could also be envisaged. So here we'll illustrate this by offering three examples of other alternative new reference scenarios that might be considered in future. And all three of these are mentioned in the article. One includes mitigation policy, the second includes climate impacts for adaptation policy, and the third includes assumptions of relevance for sustainability policy 
In this respect, if one were to construct a figure with the new reference scenarios, the dimensions might change from that of the SSPs, for example, showing different axes such as challenges to new climate policy or challenges to sustainability. In this first example, let us consider a graph that shows time from the present out to the end of the century on the x-axis and some measure of greenhouse gas reduction on the y-axis. So here there may be some global mitigation target for greenhouse gas concentration, for example, related to the Paris Agreement, which might be the goal of our policy analysis for some point in the future. In other words, where we want to be. Using a conventional SSP reference pathway, we could represent future global developments without climate policy intervention, with greenhouse gas concentrations determined by all those societal developments and other policies that might influence them. That is the conventional counterfactual. So what kind of policies might be needed to approach the greenhouse gas target? There's provision for considering this in the scenarios framework outlined in the article by means of so-called shared climate policy assumptions or SPAs. One application of SPAs used, for example, in the recent IPCC re report on the one and a half degrees warming relates to ongoing policies. There's been recent interest in studying the effectiveness of mitigation policies that have already been committed by countries around the world, the so-called nationally determined contributions or NDCs, by appending these to the SSPs. These produce an SPA of what has been promised under the Paris Agreement and what this might mean for greenhouse gas concentrations. So that's the brown line. However, while the NDCs can make progress towards the greenhouse gas targets, they're currently inadequate to get close to them. To achieve this requires consideration of other more stringent mitigation scenarios. It's the red. However, the conventional SSP reference scenarios are increasingly looked at as being unrealistic because we know that mitigation policy is already occurring. In a sense, then, the SPAs that account for ongoing policy the brown on the previous figure, might be regarded by some analysts as more representative as a counterfactual or baseline to use for analysing policies than would be required to take us beyond what can be achieved by policies already committed in the NDCs. These new reference scenarios would hence depart from the non-intervention SSPs as they would include mitigation policies that have already been committed. Our second example focuses on impacts and adaptation. A clear imperative of international policy is improvements in human security with respect to food, clean water, other natural resources and employment, so as to avoid potential conflicts and associated impacts such as migration. Aspirations for human security are embedded in such targets as the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Resource scarcity and conflicts have occurred throughout history and would be anticipated even in the absence of climate change. A counterfactual scenario such as an SSP might therefore describe situations where we might otherwise have been heading if there were no climate change occurring, no climate impacts and no climate policy. The only trends occurring would be societal developments that might influence human security, such as poverty, pollution or inequality. A policy scenario might then focus on putting in place measures for alleviating poverty, for developing agriculture, for conflict resolution, or for establishing emergency safety nets. However, as in the mitigation case, such a reference scenario doesn't really reflect realistic conditions of what we, we would actually expect in the future. Indeed, a conventional impact analysis would usually focus on estimating how future climate change would impact food or water security under different assumed levels of socioeconomic development expressed by SSPs and mitigation expressed by RCP-based climate projections. With respect to a target of improved human security, the impact scenario might actually provide a more useful new reference where the policy scenario would then address many of the same issues as was the case without climate change, but here within the context of adapting to climate change, which might itself have exacerbated issues such as food and water security, inequality and poverty, hence offering a more realistic reference for new policies. As such, with the climate policy focus, <clears throat> this time for adaptation policy, 
This could also be described as a shared policy assumption. The third example departs from the previous two cases in that it widens the focus beyond climate policy alone to the broader scope of sustainability. Given that most climate policy is inextricably linked to broader environmental and, and economic policies, it's long been understood that there can be advantages of treating climate as part of a wider set of policy needs. The set of SSPs developed for climate change analysis could potentially be applied as reference scenarios for studying wider issues, such as biodiversity and sustainable development. Here we consider targets of sustainable development for which the SDGs are useful near-term examples. Conventional SSPs could provide a reference for evaluating progress towards sustainable development goals brought about by key socioeconomic drivers in the absence of climate change or climate impacts or climate policy. In other words, where we might otherwise be heading in the absence of those. Then policy scenarios might use these reference scenarios as a point of departure for considering policies for attaining sustainable development targets, such as through poverty alleviation, nature-based solutions, or pollution reduction, for example. However, given the crucial importance of climate change and its impacts and policy implications for the achievement of sustainable development objectives, it might perhaps be more realistic to assess where we could be heading through a set of integrated scenarios, including SSPs, the nationally determined contributions, the RCPs and climate impacts. Then, by using this as a policy reference in the context of sustainable development, there will be an opportunity to consider climate policy measures alongside and in concert with sustainable development policy measures for achieving sustainability targets. So to summarise, new reference scenarios based on, but as a development of, the SSP framework could firstly offer more realism as baseline counterfactuals than SSPs, Second, could reflect recent developments in climate policy not captured in the SSPs. Third, they could broaden the applicability of policy scenarios beyond climate, hence contributing to efforts towards greater coherence in policies for environment and development. As a final note of caution though, with different types of reference scenarios being used in different contexts to address different policy questions, it would be essential to provide clear labeling of new reference scenarios so that they can be distinguished from each other and from the original SSPs, for example, to avoid possible double counting of policies or of impacts. Yeah, thanks uh, for that, uh, Tim. Uh, then uh, we move to Elmar Kriegler, uh, who is the um, head of the research department Transformation Pathways at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact. Uh, research and who will uh, dive deeper into uh, mitigation uh, policy baselines and how those are used and can be used. Yeah, thanks a lot, Bas. Um, and thanks a lot, Tim, for this great introduction. So I can jump right into the question of um, the use of reference scenarios for mitigation pathways, uh, pathway analysis, but in the second part of this present short presentation, I will also talk about um, the use of reference scenarios for sustainable development um, pathway analysis. Now, um, I'm um, trying to move my slides. So let's see if I'm, yeah, successful I am. Um, so the, original um, use of reference, reference scenarios in the, in the scenario framework as proposed in climatic change special issue in 2014 was basically to think of a counterfactual no climate policy baseline scenario. Um, and actually um, this could be formalized as having a carbon price of zero, having no emission targets and these kind of things. So simply no action to reduce emissions. In the a paper on shared climate policy assumption, in also in the special issue in 2014, this even received a name, it was the so-called SPA zero, so no climate policy. And it then, um, this approach was reflected 
in the special issue um, in global environmental change that actually presented a set of uh, emission scenarios and energy and land use scenarios that were be, that, that have been based on the SSP RCP approach. So the overview paper by Riai et al. Um, those were called um, SSP one two three four five base. Um, they included didn't include any climate policy. And, and some of them have been picked up in the Carpet Model Intercomparison Project 6 as part of Scenario MIP, have been uh, run by Earth System models and are now have now been assessed in the Working Group 1 report um, of, um, of the IPCC that was published in August. So that's, that's uh, for example, the SSP3 7.0 scenario and the SSP5 8.5 scenario are these typical no policy counterfactual um, baseline scenarios. However, in the recent years, closely linked to the adoption of the Paris Agreement, uh, there have been lots of studies in the mitigation um, scenario literature that already introduced, ref that used reference scenarios that went beyond these counterfactual baseline scenarios. Uh, two typical examples are a scenario called current policies extended. Um, and so that would basically take the scenarios currently implemented, and that's a moving target, of course, and then tries to extend them into the future without adding additional policies. Then there's a scenario that is uh, called the NDC uh, scenario and extended, where those country plans targets uh, for 2030 are, are being included, and then this level of ambition is extrapolated into the future. So we have seen a number of studies like uh, uh, out of the advanced city links engage commit projects where they also do multi-model comparison studies that have adopted these types of reference scenarios that included policy uh, but also some use cases have adopted these scenarios for example uh, the recent publication um, of the ng uh, of this um, scenarios by the network for greening the financial system for the financial sector so with the emergence of these scenarios one can say Global mitigation analysis is actually moving closer to, uh, to national uh, mitigation pathway analysis because the fact that there will be policies in a reference scenario has been long, has been, of course, long standing um, um, element of national pathway analysis. I want to give you two examples rather quickly. One is the example of the City Links project. So that is a paper uh, by Mark uh, Rolfsemite, I published in Nature Communications in 2020. And if you focus on the right hand side first, you see a graph um, where these different policy cases are compared. So the black one on top is still the classic counterfactual no policy scenario. Then there's a national policy scenario um, where the current policies have been implemented. And you can see it's a reduction, but it's only a small reduction compared to the no policy case. Then we have in orange uh, this NDC case where the country plans for 2030 are built into the scenario work. And you can see a difference between what's currently implemented and what the NDCs are, um, uh, are asking countries to do. And that is now also called in the literature implementation gap. Um, and then you see the classic comparison between what the countries have proposed, the NDCs in orange, and what it would take to directly act on the two degree or 1.5 degree scenario. So in, in, in green and in, in, in yellow. And these things, uh, um, the difference between the two is, is the classic emissions gap that is um, uh, presented in the UNEP gap report. And on the left-hand side, I'm not going into these details. You can see how those two reference scenarios, the current national policy scenarios and the NDC scenarios have been defined in the study. So if you want to look up an example how this is done and it's getting quite complex, of course, then this study is a good, good source. So the second example I would like to give you is uh, from the NGFS um, publication of transition scenarios. So these are scenarios directly oriented to users from the financial sector um, to use them for financial risk analysis. And you can see this matrix that the NGFS has formulated uh, in terms of transition. So you have an orderly and a disorderly transition on the y-axis and the physical risk that is entailed with these scenarios, that's basically the warming level. Um, and you can see on the, in the 
lower right quadrant, these two reference scenarios, again, emerging the current policies and the NDC scenarios. And those would be scenarios that are shown here. So the current policy in gray, a three degree, and then um, NDCs extrapolated uh, any more for 2.5 degrees. Uh, and one important thing to note here is already that those scenarios, even the current policy scenarios, which is the weakest here, are substantially lower than the RCP 5, 8.5 uh, from the original SSP study and assessed in working group one of the IPCC, because those scenarios don't include um, um, current policies. And also a bit outdated, there's no technology trends included, uh, recent technology trends. Now, takeaway messages from this part is, um, so the, the concept of shared climate policy assumptions is, is implicitly applied in the mitigation pathway analysis of both reference and ambitious climate policy scenarios. They don't call it necessarily SPAs, but they, these are SPAs because they are commonly used across studies and across models within a study. Um, the SPAs can, uh, so can, uh, that means obviously the SPAs can be used to formalize these co common reference policy assumptions and to define a range of reference uh, reference scenarios. So there is not a single one, there can be many to compare the implementation gap, for example, um, uh, with the emissions gap. And finally, um, the SPAs turn out to be useful in this sense, and they are obviously the most dynamic element of this SSP RCP SPA scenario framework that allows to, to keep the framework up to date with the rapidly evolving policy landscape. So the SPAs would need to be updated frequently in order to capture these latest developments. Now, let me move on quickly to the second uh, part of my presentation, which is shorter on new references scenarios for sustainable development analysis. So the first thing to notice here is really to, um, um, to, to acknowledge that the SSP narratives already include a number of um, or imply a number of sustainable development policies or sustainable development trends. So this neat separation between a background development that you have in the SSPs and the climate policy assumption that you have in the SPAs is no longer working. And so that this, this dichot dichot dichotomy between SSPs and SPAs might no longer be suitable here. That was already indicated in the in the O'Neill et al. 2017 paper on the narratives where basically these SSPs were allocated in the space bet uh, between economic growth and social societal sustainability and environmental sustainability. And as we know, um, these SSPs have strong, strong implications on these axes. Now, one example how that could be used in, in a policy decomposition is a recent paper um, on, a, on a sustainable development pathway and how to, to move on to a sustainable de development pathway from current trends by Zergel et al. in Nature Climate Change. They're basically, as part of the policy analysis, the switch from SSP2, which is a more middle of the road development, to SSP1 um, was, um, was used. You can see this here on the left hand side. So, an SSP2 NDC trend was converted into a step to an SSP1 world where there is already this is linked to some policy changes. So, the world is moving from SSP2 to SSP1. Um, and then, on top of that, you can impose climate policy and additional uh, sustainable development packages. And that is my uh, second last sl slide. This decomposition basically allowed you to, um, to try to, um, um, uh, uh, or these scenarios try to um, decom allowed you to decompose um, the policies leading to the achievement of, of the sustainable development goal. For example, when it comes to nitrogen fixation in this um, SDP pathway, you could see that current trends would move you up, away from the target down here in dashed lines, then this shift from SSP2 to SSP1 helps you to get back, and then the other policies come in. So that's uh, an, an extension of the SSP, RCP, SPA framework, if you want, and that's my last slide because I'm over time. Um, uh, there are uh, two takeaway messages here. First, uh, new types of reference scenarios will be needed. And the second, it may require to move between the traditional separation of SSPs and SPAs and extend the scenario framework when we think of reference scenarios for sustainable development pathway analysis. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks a lot, Elmar, for a very clear overview with examples of uh, how this is done in, in practice. Um, then we move on to uh, Francisca Piontek, uh, who will uh, give a few examples of uh, impact baseline scenarios uh, that look on the other side of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the framework, not the challenges to mitigation, but to the challenges to adaptation and the impact. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I would like to start um, just to say again why on the impact side um, such scenarios are needed now, urgently. Um, the one is scenario realism, we already heard about that. And I think maybe many of us have experienced, uh, we are increasingly experiencing in interactions with users and stakeholders from very different backgrounds um, that they are interested to know exactly what the future will bring in terms of impacts um, and how they can react to that when planning mitigation and adaptation measures and policies. Um, so the scenarios, including impacts, are something which is demanded. Then another important need is um, the, to quantify the benefits of mitigation. Um, that is something which even in this current round of the IPCC report, we are still not really able to do very well, um, at least on an economic side. Um, simply we are still lacking the integrated scenarios looking at mitigation and impacts jointly, um, which would allow us to do that. And that is quite a gap um, which we still need to fill. And then finally, this idea of assessing effects of certain impacts on a broader policy goal, um, which was already mentioned by Tim and which I'll give another couple of examples for um, where we already have sort of the, the tools we need um, to do that available in the, in the literature. I am coming from the, the integrated assessment modeling. So I'm um, really concerned about this uh, benefits of mitigation and the integrated scenarios. So this is a little bit where, my, where, where the examples will also come from. Um, let me start with giving you a few examples of where impacts are already integrated and presented in the RCP and SSP space. Um, when you look at this figure, um, this shows basically the chains of modeling going from biophysical impacts um, to, towards economic impacts by first assessing aggregate effects across sectors without any feedbacks and dynamics, um, and then uh, having the final economic impact, which includes dynamic effects, for example, through investment reports. On all of these levels, um, we have some literature which assesses impacts also related to SSPs, but it's very different how it's done. Um, on the biophysical level, um, we do have a lot of literature in the RCP SSP space um, where you can, which focuses on sectoral impacts. Um, they can be valued already, they can be biophysical only. Um, and often there, there is a link to SSPs, uh, but the SSP representation may be limited. Um, often it's it's only based on population and GDP projections. Um, and one reason for that, I think, is well that some of the models of the biophysical models may not really capture many dimensions, but also because often the data are missing on the uh, required level of resolution these models have um, so that they could take them up. Um, that might be, for example, future projections of dams um, for um, hydrological applications um, or also downscale electricity production um, again, for sort of hydropower applications, um, there's still a lot of work of downscaling to be done um, to, to give the relevant, SSP relevant impact to these models. Coming to this triple level here um, of assessing uh, economic impacts from different sectors together. Again, um, this is done generally for different RCPs and sometimes also for different SSPs, although that is um, in the very limited literature, and I'll show you a couple of examples. And then finally, we come to this integrated assessment of mitigation and impacts. Um, and again, we have very, very few examples to do this. Let's look at first the, um, the impacts uh, without, uh, without, um, uh, without the dynamic effects. We have on the left hand an example by Takakura et al. applying a CGE modeling framework with bottom up impacts. So you have um, about nine different channels where impacts enter the model um, and affect the economic system. And across the different 
four different RCPs and five different SSPs, um, the impact in terms of GDP loss is monetized. And then that is even translated into damage functions. So temperature here and loss here, GDP loss here. Um, and you can see that there are slight differences for the different SSPs for these damage functions. Here we have a very transparent view of what kind of impacts are included. Um, but of course, it's also limited, um, the number of impacts which can possibly be picked up in this framework. Um, on the right-hand side, we see a, a top-down application where the econom econometric damage function from Birkedal is applied by um, calculating losses in per capita GDP based on the different um, projections for the different SSPs. Again, for different RCPs, again, you can see for the different SSPs, we see slight differences in the resulting damage functions, if you want to call it. For that application, um, there is a number of problems involved, and we, can, we cannot really go into, into detail in that here. Um, one particular one is that we have an aggregate GDP loss. It's a little bit intransparent of what kind of impacts are included there. And again, also many things are missing here, for example, extreme events. There's also examples of doing cost-benefit analysis. Uh, one more thing I want to say is, of course, now you can um, compute the benefits of mitigation by just looking at the differences between the different RCPs. Um, there is no notion here of having certain um, SSP, RCP combinations as baseline. Uh, simply the whole matrix um, space is usually assessed. Looking at cost-benefit analysis, that is also done um, relating to SSPs very rarely though. And there's one example by Glanemann et al, where the DICE model is actually calibrated um, to, uh, um, to match the SSP GDP trajectories and also using the population data to sort of resemble the different SSPs. It's com combined then again with these Birkedal um, very large growth, um, growth rate damage functions. Um, and the paper presents optimal temperatures um, under these damages for different um, for the different SSPs, you can see that this is quite the, the level is quite different for the different SSPs, which is found there. Um, here we have the optimal temperature based on this one given damage function. Um, typically, from these papers, you cannot easily assess the benefits because at least you can't calculate them easily because the baseline, while it's used, of course, it's not necessarily given there. So afterwards, you can you can see the optimal. Uh, temperature level, but you cannot really calculate the benefits. Finally, we have the uh, another approach, we, which is called least total cost modeling. The idea here is to combine a typical guardrail approach um, where you set a temperature target with damages which are already occurring before you reach that target. So that is typically something which is left out um, in the integrated assessment scenarios which enter the IPCC. Um, but however, to in integrate the damages here is really crucial because they have an important effect, especially on near-term mitigation um, pathways, as you can see here, um, including damages, which is depicted here in blue, um, would lead to a much stronger near-term mitigation. Again, there are differences across the SSPs here, although that uncertainty dimension is not as large as the uncertainty coming from the representation of the damages. Now then, you want to actually look at the benefits from mitigation here, um, you would have to decompose this um, into losses and, and gains. And for that, you will need actually two baselines. You will need the baseline without damages, and you will need a baseline with damages to calculate these two different things. And you can also then decompose the total loss into the loss coming from damages and from mitigation um, to really uh, have the different components clearly transparently on the table. This includes all the um, interaction effects, um, but it's computationally um, very demanding. A final example is post-processing integrated assessment runs. Um, there is a paper by the way that which is currently under review. Um, so I can't really show you uh, nice, uh, nice pictures here, um, but here uh, there is a post-processing done by the, for the integrated assessment scenarios, basically combining uh, the temperature pathways coming um, included in the, for example, in the SR1.5 database, combining them with different damage functions. So here you can 
um, do a large uncertainty analysis for different damage functions and also for other uncertainty parameters to look at the avoided damages. So combining the SSP baseline with damages, very similar to the figure um, we saw before by Tim, <clears throat> having the SSP baseline with damages and then the policy run with damages. And there you then have the avoided impacts. Similar for the mitigation costs, and then you compare, compare the two. In the post-processing, <coughs> In the cost processing, you miss the interaction effects. <clears throat> Excuse me, hope it's better now. But um, you don't have the computationally demanding models, and so this allows for more sensitivity analysis. <clears throat> Coming to some examples for using selection of impacts for broader outcomes. I first have this interplay of impacts, mitigation, and adaptation. Examples, of course, for that are the land and the energy sector. If you look at impacts on crop yields, on forests, on water availability, these impacts strongly interact with adaptation to them, which, for example, irrigation or changes in land use, and mitigation for example, bioenergy, hydropower, or afforestation. Another impact I mentioned, which plays in here, is increased energy to machen from, for example, for air condition. And to assess this interplay, we need these integrated scenarios, and we need baselines which represent the impacts, but also some baseline adaptation to those impacts. Where then additional adaptation measures could be quantified in SPAs focused on adaptation. Another example is the conflict example related to this human security example Tim already showed. We actually, if, if our outcome or intended outcome is improved human security, a reduction of conflicts, um, then we have, of course, impacts which of, of climate change which possibly drive conflict already. Um, we have actually projections for countries experiencing armed conflict under the different SSPs uh, in a paper by Hegre et al, which takes drivers like population size or socioeconomic development together with the history of conflict of countries to create these projections for different world regions. <clears throat> you also know from the literature that, for example, climate-related disasters um, can increase um, the likelihood for a country to move into conflict. And so these things could be combined to actually change these baselines here, which do not include climate change, and make them more realistic to say, well, in an SSP5 world, which gets very hot, um, which will experience a lot more natural disasters, this expected share of countries with armed conflicts is actually much larger than what is seen here. And then from that more realistic baseline, we can design policies which would respond to that increased risk. The final example is inequality. We have, um, a, we have already literature by Zirgel et al, again, which does projections of future population in poverty along the different SSPs, driven by average income and Gini projections. The paper looks at the effects of policy, of climate policy, on the, on the poverty and also possible mitigation effects of this increased poverty level from potentially from climate policy by redistribution. It does not include climate impact simply because we don't have the ability to do that yet. However, including impacts would most likely already in the baseline increase the number of people living in poverty and therefore would require um, other measures. Also, the interaction then, again, of impacts and mitigation measures would matter a lot for the redistribution um, policies you would assume. Um, finally, some, some discussion points which matter here before we um, can really provide model-based baselines for 
uh, for SSPs with, with impacts, we really need um, to have, this, have the impacts integrated in the models and to really have a handle on this integrated analysis. Um, the literature there is really very sparse and um, we need to advance that. Um, of course, one challenge is always the coverage of impacts. Um, it's always incomplete. Um, it will depend on the question we want to answer. Um, it's important that we are simply very clear of what is included and what is not. And we could also think about what we should include, um, what are important drivers to include. Um, we might think about a storyline approach here to amend um, the existing storylines by having an impact storyline to assess all, all the possible channels, including the missing risks, which we will not be able to model, but to have sort of the full picture, at least as a basis. Um, important are the, the uncertainty dimension, um, which is something to be considered. We know by now that having one damage function, for example, is not enough, uh, given the large uncertainty there. So that is something which we have to discuss. Um, how much adaptation should already be presented in the baseline, given the different adaptive capacities, is another thing which um, is very open to me. And finally, I think for communication, but also for us, um, it would be important to establish guidelines um, for labels, for variables, for how to really include these things. Um, because if we want to have a strong literature basis in, in view of the next assessment report, um, this, we need to make sure that the literature on that is also comparable. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Francesca. Um, then before we open up for uh, Q&A, we have a few words still from uh, Tim Carter on adaptation uh, in policy baselines. Um, and also I want to stress, if you have any uh, questions, uh, please add them in the chat uh, to any of the speakers uh, or uh, later raise your hands once we are in the, in the Q&A part. But first, a uh, few words from Tim. Okay, th thanks very much, um, Bas. And uh, I think I, I will not show anything actually now because I think the time is passing rather quickly. So I'll just give a few very, very quick uh, sort of summary comments um, out of those very, very um, uh, elaborately um, uh, presented uh, examples we've already seen. And the integrated assessment examples are, are very interesting for the, for the climate change impacts and adaptation elements there. But of course, that's global scale mainly, and it's uh, sort of rather, rather, rather uh, different from a lot of the impacts and adaptation re research that goes on uh, around the world in regional and local studies. And typically, um, those sort of studies, um, as I think I was trying to illustrate in, in, the, in the introductory um, uh, video about the impacts, at least the impacts and adaptation aspects, um, typically when you're doing a, an impact study, you um, already actually would, would include climate change uh, for estimating impacts before addressing climate policy. So typically uh, a counterfactual um, in impact assessment would normally include climate change and you would be then comparing climate change impacts on a, on a sector or on, on whatever, whatever the uh, exposure unit is um, with and without adaptation and typically also with and without mitigation and that would be coming through the climate projections that have been used using whatever whatever um, assumptions about um, um, mitigation policy so so but both then can draw on the adaptation and the mitigation can draw on the so-called share shared climate policy assumptions but they do so in rather different ways um, so I I, I did have some slides to illustrate that in more detail, but I won't show them. Now, just a couple of other things though. Um, so we also uh, illustrated that um, um, for, the, for the baseline situation, the SSPs, um, th there are examples where it might be useful to include impacts already. Um, the example I showed was for the human security example where um, by, by already including impacts of um, aspects of human security, such as food or uh, water security, then one might actually then be able to uh, have some sort of reference against which you could then look at additional policies that might be needed for security and you know, policy needs. But you could also think of this in, in, in research terms as a, an opportunity to, uh, to also isolate different impacts and then look at other impacts. And so, for example, um, 
here, um, the, 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 and Francisca mentioned this as well, for the, for the human security case, uh, isolating the water and uh, food security aspects might allow you to look more, more, more in detail at uh, impacts of climate change on, on conflict, for example. Another example, she also raised this actually, or she mentioned it, um, is the whole issue around um, water resources, uh, irrigation. Uh, so you might want to look at water availability separately from then looking at, well, what are the implications then of water availability, which you're already building in maybe to your reference scenario for agricultural production. So, so, so I think there are some opportunities there to uh, use baseline conditions uh, in a slightly different way and re or reference conditions that maybe include impacts in order to study more, in more detail some other aspects of, of the impacts and adaptations that you're interested in. Finally, just one other um, more perhaps more subtle issue, but that, that it re relates to the way that uh, impact analysts study adaptation and uh, impact models typically are not particularly strong at capturing adaptation measures, but of course many impact models attempt to do this. Um, one of the, one of the um, interesting and uh, difficult things to isolate is whether um, impact models actually implicitly include adaptation as a sort of autonomous uh, response to climate change, and some impact models do, not always explicitly. And I think that um, has maybe implications also for, for, for how explicit we are about um, accounting for those autonomous adaptations when we're actually um, thinking about how we apply SSPs and SPAs. In, in the scenarios framework. So they're just a few extra thoughts, but I, I think I'll leave it there and uh, leave it for discussion now. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Tim. And if I can ask uh, Francisca and Elmar also to uh, come, come back in visibility, uh, then uh, we can uh, open up for some, uh, for, uh, for some Q and A here. So if anyone has uh, questions in the audience, please raise your hand. Uh, or put your question in the chat. I see that Jarmo already put um, one question in the chat here, like would it, whether it would make uh, sense to also include indicators for something like economic interregional dependence, which may influence how you know, impacts affect uh, society or what kind of interregional value of monetary transfers are possible in a more globalized or localized world. So whether... Um, which in one way goes, resonates, I think, with what we have across SSPs, where some reason, uh, SSPs are more local and, one, and more globalizing, um, but to have indicators uh, for that. Um, who wants to take that? Tim, go ahead. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. It's actually something that has uh, arisen um, <clears throat> in a current um, European Union funded, European Commission funded project called uh, uh, Cascades, which is uh, based on looking at uh, cross-border impacts of climate change. So this is in the impacts and adaptation uh, sphere. Um, we've recognized that um, developing scenarios um, for impacts that may be occurring remotely from where the uh, risks might, might actually be felt um, means that you're actually what you have. There's, there's, a, there's a question posed as to as to what uh, assumptions can you make about the future, and how do you actually apply the SSB RCB framework to those sorts of uh, impacts, where an impact may occur somewhere else in the world. For example, it might be affecting agriculture severely, and there are food supply problems, which might lead to um, price rises and food riots, or these sorts of um, uh, propagating impacts. So how does one actually apply scenarios to that sort of uh, propagating type of cascading impact um, environment um, in different parts of the world? So, so that, that's something we might need to think a bit more about how we actually look at the interconnectedness of the, of the global system and how that might be captured in some of the, uh, in the SSPs in the future or, or equivalent to scenarios. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And in the meantime, there are some more questions coming in in the chat. Um, and I think uh, Claudia here clearly hits the, the nail on its head on why this was not done, I think, so far in the in the first incarnation of the SSP RCP framework, um, which mostly resonates on the, the argument of, of uncertainty. Um, you know, 
if we have one single baseline without impact and without policy uncertainty, that is one that we can provide and start to work with. But of course, through all of the talks that we have seen so far, uh, we see that there's many different options of Im imposing the mitigation policies, of, of thinking about the uh, uh, about about the impacts, uh, and and if you then want to go to a single policy baseline or an impact baseline, you're sort of fl uh, yeah, you know, slamming flat a lot of that um, that uncertainty uh, by going to a certain uh, a single baseline. And so that's uh, what Claudia asked here: um, Should we provide a single scenario with the impact or with the policy or a range? Um, how how should we go about? Uh, addressing this in IEMs with a certain set of parameter settings, should we think about ranges or single uh, scenarios? Um, can the panel flag whether they <laughs> want to pick something up and they want to answer something? <laughs> yes, Elmar. <laughs> Yeah, I will only briefly say something on the uncertainty because I think that's also something for Francisca, uh, uncertainty on, on the impact side. But but very quickly, of course, the, the scenario framework needs involvement in, in various directions. So so here, the, when we talk about new reference scenarios, we are interested, of course, in, in using these reference scenarios to, to understand differences between the scenarios in terms of what, what, what a change does a policy make how big is an impact and these kind of things. Um, orthogonal to it, we want to vary some assumptions um, in the scenarios that constituent, uh, that make the, that we, as some assumptions, key assumptions when we, when we develop them and then we could look at this delta, whatever it is, the impact of a policy or the size of an impact um, for, under these different assumptions and we would get a distribution. Um, an uncertainty distribution for this delta. Um, and there's, I think in the O'Neill paper, also a separate um, uh, recommendation on, uh, on improve the uncertainty analysis. I think it is a, a challenge for a scenario framework because uh, uh, you need to sample a larger space. And if your uncertainty is multidimensional, you quickly come into, into these dimensionality problems. So again, you would want to wonder whether you also need to come up with some scenarios to sample the uncertainty, like important sampling or so forth, or something like that. So that, that's my thought on this. Definitely having different damage functions in the context of impacts would be important. Different assumptions about climate sensitivity would be important. Actually, the NGFS project, and Francisca led this work in the, NGF, in the, uh, to, in the production of scenarios for the NGFS, um, there, there is uncertainty bands for climate sensitivity. Um, but I want to take this other question on, uh, on, on how realistic is it to connect uh, um, um, uh, a, a global scenario in the region is now with similar economic pattern of GDP and would it be possible for reconstruction? Um, uh, that's a new question, right? Yeah, I, there, there was this other one by um, Gaurav Sharma on the GDP dips after the pandemic. Um, and that's a very important uh, uh, question because uh, it points to the fact that not only the policy assumptions in these SPAs become, become quickly outdated, but also some built-in uh, historic developments uh, in the GDP and population trajectories for the SS that, that are very deduced from the SSPs. So there needs to be a process of constantly updating also the SSPs. And that's also being discussed right now to have a process to do this. Obviously, since a lot of studies rely on the framework, you cannot do this every six months or so. So there needs to be some frequency, but we just had a pandemic. We do have a, a COVID dip uh, in socioeconomic quantities. And so we need to reflect that. The question of course is when is the sweet spot to do it? If you do it too early, you come up with something that might be outdated only a year later because the recovery from COVID played out differently. But I think now may be a good time to have something by mid of next. Uh, next year. Over to you, Francis. Yes, and it actually it is the theme of uh, the next webinar that we are scheduling for about a month from now to uh, discuss the, the the plans that are making the rounds for updating uh, the drivers of the of the SSPs and how to take COVID into account. Um, so that that goes to to Gurav Sharma's first question. Um, <laughs> 
Um, on the second question, I have to say, I don't immediately grasp the, the core of the question. So if you want to verbally uh, uh, ask it uh, and explain it a bit further, uh, Gora, feel, feel free to, to raise your hand and we, and we can unmute you. If we can. <laughs> that was apparently uh, too much to ask. Or yeah, are you here so, now? Uh, <laughs> yeah, about this first question, actually, uh, like uh, how like we can give these uh, SSPs like a sort of uh, what, what they said today, like the policy integrated approach, so that they are realistic in terms of research and applicability. The first question. Uh, I just want to ask this: that how, uh, like, realistic uh, framework we can give to a SSP plus an integrated policy sort of thing for regional and global pattern, so that uh, they are more reliable and more realistic for the research and the community. Yeah, thank you. I think that yeah, I see what you. I think I see what you mean. That uh, by making them these scenarios more policy, bringing yeah. in the policy baselines and the impact baselines, they become more uh, realistic. Uh, but at the same time, um, we create a complicated uh, setup of a very specific, uh, of a very specific future. Okay. Elmar? Yeah, I, um, if I understand your question correctly, um, what is global because the SSP RCP approach has this global formulation and then when it is used for regional analysis there are quickly tensions first the narrative is global the question is how to relate it to to local developments and second these trajectories that we have and and particular GDP and population we do have over the country level might not match what what is generally discussed on on the country level um, because um, governments often have their own scenarios, how, how, how GDP will evolve in their country or population. Um, and I think that's, that's a very interesting topic um, and a topic on its own. I do believe drawing links between, um, between these global and regional level would be enormously fruitful for the process, um, for the scenario process, because, uh, for example, if you have local narratives, how these narratives can map to the global ones is, is very useful. There are some studies out there on the narrative side. How, how to deal with quantitative information um, is more difficult, because in order to have these global scenarios, we do need to have a global data set, which is consistently produced. You cannot do patchwork and have one baseline from one country and another one. but. When we develop, uh, when an update is done, uh, it might be useful, this goes more now out to, to Iconics, to organize a process where there can be some regional vetting of these scenarios. And, and, and as a third point, I think we should acknowledge that these things can differ. Um, there are government scenarios and they, they don't need to be um, right, right? So there are also different opinions sometimes. So having some uncertainty analysis about these socioeconomic projections is, is also useful. Yeah, thanks a lot, Elmar. Um, and and definitely such such review process. We more or less had that in the first round, and if we do an update, it's useful to to have uh, some some process like that uh, as well. I see Allah who asked now uh, a question here also on how these continuous updates actually should relate to the cycle uh, to cycles of uh, <laughs> IPCC assessment, COPS, and UNFCCC. I think this is a great question to discuss at next month. Um, uh, webinar where we'll go into the up, uh, dive specifically into the, the process of updating uh, the scenarios um, and actually also related to that global national question uh, we are our global and regional level linking question uh, we are also planning uh, for later this fall another webinar on exactly how to bring together the dynamics at the global and the regional uh, level so that's another topic uh, coming up there um, so with that um, I uh, think we are reaching the end actually of this of this of this webinar here.
I want to thank uh, all three speakers for their uh, for their great examples and introductions to this uh, topic of the integrated uh, baselines. There, uh, you know, really, these integration really helps to to make the scenarios framework produce more realistic scenarios. But at the same time, uh, per, you know, all every step of this integration creates comes with its own. Uh, uncertainties and specific assumptions that we make. And so we're building slowly into a rather complicated uh, framework if we uh, over, over the course of the years. So this is to be continued in how we actually fit this into uh, the framework, uh, but um, definitely useful to have this uh, discussion with examples here uh, today. So thank you, Tim, Francisca, uh, Elmar, uh, and uh, Fa for supporting us here. And uh, thank you all for joining and see you next month at the next webinar. <laughs>